everyone. Uh, my name is Naeem Kalwar and I am Extension Soil Health Specialist um, out of Langdon. With me is Dr. Abby Vick, who is our State Soil Health Specialist, and is Scott Swenson, who is helping us with uh, uh, Zoom. Welcome to the NDSU Zoom Soil Health Webinar Series. Uh, this webinar series, the way we have uh, designed it, it will have six uh, featured uh, speakers, and they will cover a wide uh, range of soil health topics on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 o'clock uh, for three weeks starting today. And uh, you could join these web webinars uh, through your smartphones or computers or flip phones, uh, whichever you know they works for you at 11 o'clock again, Tuesdays and uh, Thursdays. Each webinar, the way uh, things will work. We'll have one uh, pre-recorded presentation and then we'll follow it up with question and answer. Now, you most probably would be muted, but you could unmute yourself. Would it prefer that during the, you could, if it is a too much of a burning question, you could just put it in the chat box and then we'll try to answer that between me, Abby and Scott. But or, otherwise we could just ask the questions, uh, say at the end or, or for that matter, if you wanted to discuss something. So for today, uh, our featured speaker is Dr. Aaron Day. You know, last fall was, um, it, it posed a lot of challenges when it comes to residue, um, harvesting the crops or leaving the ruts um, in the field. And we have been receiving a lot of um, questions about that. So Dr. Aaron Day, who is our assistant professor for soil physics in the Department of Natural Resource Sciences out of Fargo, so we have his pre-recorded Zoom presentation and his title is Challenges with Residue, Tillage and Ruts Following a Wet Harvest. Um, it's a slightly longish presentation, but it will have very useful information, about 55 minutes. So we could hear that and then we could, we could follow that up with uh, questions or answers or, or just to discuss different things. So with that, I'm gonna take this out and I'm gonna play Dr. Day's presentation. Okay, well, um, hello everyone. My name is Aaron Day. I am a uh, soil scientist at North Dakota State University. Uh, I am their soil physicist, which is a fancy way of saying that I study how things move, whether that be water, heat, um, nutrients or the soil itself. Um, but today what I thought would be useful to talk about is a topic that uh, we've uh, hit at numerous events throughout the winter this year, uh, particularly talking about and anticipating challenges with residue management, soil tillage, and with ruts, uh, particularly in the context of following a wet harvest, like what we endured during uh, the fall of 2019, and for potentially a number of folks who are still um, uh, trying to get 2019's crop out of the field. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, video right here is going to be on that topic, and because everyone has their own unique situation that they are uh, that you're dealing with on your farm or on your uh, client's farms, uh, I want to hit a few different scenarios. Uh, so uh, one of the scenarios is perhaps everything got harvested and completed, uh, all your fall activities just fine. So going into the spring, it's going to be fairly business as usual for you. Uh, so we're just going to check mark that and say, um, those folks are good or at least know what to anticipate uh, this coming year. Perhaps you'll get some interesting or useful tidbits from this uh, talk right here. Uh, but for if you fall into this category or if some of your fields fall in this category, then we're going to consider those fields as good for right now at least uh, and focus on some other situations. Um, that are uh, perhaps uh, quite prevalent uh, throughout the region this particular spring because of our wet uh, fall that we had. So uh, the few scenarios that we will focus on a lot here is 
you got harvested during the fall uh, and you're able to do it uh, with no ruts, uh, but you didn't get any of your fall uh, preparations done, any of your fall field activities after that harvest was there. So got in before the wet conditions or even after the ground froze, but perhaps you're dealing with, uh, especially if you're used to tillage, you're dealing with uh, the, going into the spring with much higher residue levels than perhaps you're used to in the past. Uh, for so how to manage that. Uh, perhaps you're still waiting the harvest. Um, that 2019 crop still in the field, so time will tell depending on what uh, our spring holds for us. I know that even folks who were harvesting in the winter, uh, <clears throat> by the time February hit, there was people that were uh, finding uh, thawed uh, soil out in their field and were sinking in having quite a difficult time getting in a harvest um, because we didn't have much of a, a, a frost depth this year. Uh, the early and continuous snow cover that we received, uh, most of the soils here, at least in the valley uh, and extending outwards from the valley, uh, maybe only froze a foot or a little bit more and that was it. And so by time February came around, the soils had to actually fall from the bottom from deeper heat, thinning the frost layer. And you had snow covered soils and fields that were had no ice in them. Though. So um, that's a uh, troubling item if you try to harvest during the winter, but actually for the spring, it's actually kind of good because you get some uh, faster infiltration and drainage occurring when snow melt uh, uh, has been occurring in these last couple weeks here. So we'll talk about uh, for the folks that are perhaps still waiting to harvest and still have crops on their fields. And then uh, we'll, on the fourth item down here, we'll also talk about uh, uh, harvested. Uh, perhaps you got harvested in the fall or the winter, but oh, look at those ruts. Uh, and the thing is, that everyone faces tough choices, especially in falls uh, like what we just had. And so um uh, some pretty substantial ruts and ruts all across the fields were quite prevalent throughout the region uh and was just a reality for a, a lot of folks on it so we'll talk about dealing with those ruts and what you can expect in the years coming afterwards too uh from compaction that occurred uh with those ruts uh in those areas uh, but items uh, two and three right here these uh different scenarios uh just bear in mind that there's a lot of recommendations um, uh, uh, depending on when harvest comes, but the recommendations will kind of look similar uh, because it's just a matter of when harvest that occurred at. You're going to be dealing with high residue uh, situations uh, in both uh, scenario two and three here. So let's go ahead and get into uh, that. Um, um, First scenario that we're going to talk about. So harvested in the fall, no ruts, but you also had no uh, fall food crops. So a lot of residue on the ground. Um, perhaps for the folks that are not accustomed to a no-till situation or a high residue situation uh, for it. If you are a long-term no-tiller, then perhaps this is also just another, uh, this is probably just business as usual uh, for you. So one of the things that I like to point out and I like this graph right here uh, that I want to spend at least a moment going through is when you have a lot of residue on the soil, the first things I start thinking about with spring uh, planting is uh, our soils up here being able to dry out so we can get in and uh, uh, get a good uh, crop stand established and going. And so the water that's in the ground, it has two different routes that it can go. It can go up or it can go down. And uh, the most efficient way is for it to go down. Uh, when you have a lot of residue on the soil surface, it limits the amount of evaporation that can occur. So you're, you're reducing the amount that it can be lost upwards uh, uh, to let that soil dry out. So this graph right here, what it shows is that um, on the side here, it has the evaporation rate all the way from zero uh, going up to one. So this would be 
uh, 100% evaporation rate at the very top here. And we're looking at days on the bottom here. This is days after some wetting events. So this would be after a big rainfall event or the snow melt itself. Uh, something that would saturate the soil uh, uh, quite substantially. And then I've got a few curves on here. The very top curve is one that goes just straight across the top. This is the atmospheric demand. It just sits at 100%. So if, if the air could have its way, it's going to pull every bit of water out. This is what it would be at. It would be at 100%. It, um, uh, the atmosphere would take as much as it can. Uh, the two other lines I have on here, uh, the first one is a bare soil, that's the dotted line, that's pretty steep here after the, in the first couple of days after a wedding event. So that's 100% bare soil, just completely bare. Um, the other line, the solid one, is a 100% residue covered soil. So these are your two bookends. Uh, in your fields, you probably fall somewhere in between these two. Um, so I'm a big fan of bookends. What's, what's the two ends? Because um, if you know what those are, then you have an idea of where uh, you and everyone else are falling at in between. So the things on this graph right here to notice is that, uh, of course, this bare soil, uh, in the, uh, it's evaporating a lot more water than the 100% residue cover soil, as you would expect. This is very uh, common. It goes along with our intuition and, and experiences for things. But I want you to notice is that uh, after the first several days, this, this starts dropping down quite quickly um, because the soil is drying in that terms. And a drier soil would evaporate um, not as fast as a wet soil. So it drops down quite uh, quick over time. Uh, after about uh, three, four days, it's actually over about 50% uh, uh, efficiency at losing water out uh, for it, but it's still substantially higher than that of the residue covered uh, soil. Uh, the residue covered soil right off the bat, it's losing uh, evaporation at only half the rate of a bare soil would be. Uh, after three, four days, that now narrows up to where only it's about a quarter difference. And then if you look out here around one week and a little bit further, so in between like seven and nine days, the 100% bare and 100% residue covered soils actually come together. They converge together uh, and they behave very similarly afterwards uh, from there. So the point that I want to emphasize here is that yes, bare soils will evaporate more water than a residue covered soil. However, after about a week, a week and a half, that's not the case anymore. It doesn't matter how much residue you have out on the ground. If it's been dry, everything's going to eventually look the same after about a week, week and a half. Now, when things don't look the same is if you get uh, uh, repeated rainfall events. So if we, you know, as we continue into our spring here, uh, which is uh, when I'm making this recording here, it's, it's uh, mid-April. So if we continue this spring and we stay relatively dry, uh, it's not going to matter if you have a lot of residue on the field. It's going to dry out just the same as if it was a bare soil. But if we get in a situation where we get heavy rainfalls once a week, particularly twice a week, then we're really going to start seeing the uh, issues of high residue cover be more of a uh, issue with being able to get it and plant uh, with it because those soils are going to be wet. So it really depends on what our rainfall is going to do uh, for it. One of the things to think about too with evaporation and losing water upwards, drying the soil out upwards uh, wise, is if you look at evaporation rates again here on the side where we're zero up to 100% or one in the relative terms. Uh, and then instead of time after a wedding event, now we're looking at just tons of residue per acre. Uh, when we think of tons per acre, um, out on the field, uh, it's 
we see a similar trend where the higher amount of tonnage, the more coverage there is, and the lower the evaporation rate. But the annoying thing is, is that uh, different residue types will have their own curves, and it's and it becomes residue type specific on what you can expect to happen, and that's uh, actually a, an annoyance there. Uh, a much better metric to use for evaporation rates is actually not the tonnage or the percent coverage of residue. Those metrics are fantastic for uh, indicators of things like wind and water erosion, but they're not a good indicator uh, or the most precise indicator of how much evaporation you're going to lose. The better metric is actually the thickness of the residue type. And the reason being is that it almost doesn't matter at all what type of residue you have out there, whether it's soybean, cotton, wheat, uh, or any other crop. Uh, they all tend to follow pretty much the same line. That's a very nice convenience for it. And you can see that in this graph right here. This is the same data set. It's just now looking at residue thickness in inches uh, from the ground. So this is residue that's actually sitting on the ground. This is not standing stocks. So this is residue on the ground for it. And something I'll just point out here is that I put in a red line um, down here at the one inch thickness. And if you follow that up to the data and then go to the side, uh, you'll see that uh, at a one inch thickness, we're now down to about 30% of the maximum evaporation rate that is possible, uh, that the atmosphere would, uh, is thirsty for. So 70% of the evaporation rate uh, drop occurs in the first inch. After that first inch, you go out to two inches, three inches, four inches, it, it, it matters a teeny tiny bit very little bit. Uh, most of the bang for the buck is in that top inch or in that first inch. So if you're doing some kind of residue management practice and you're thinning down four inches down to two inches, you're not really gaining much ground. It's not until you get underneath the one inch thickness that you see a big jump in the change of evaporation rates for it. Um, but thinning down the residue layer can substantially change the evaporation rate. You can have very high coverage of uh, the uh, soil covered by crop residue and still being able to get it to dry out if you can uh, thin down that residue management layer. And we'll show some examples of that uh, in some trials and uh, upcoming slides here soon. So in this graph right here, what I want to show is really a uh, demonstration of that first graph where, where we saw that a bare soil versus a 100% covered soil after about a week, they started uh, behaving the same on how dry that soil was uh, if you didn't get an additional rainfall. So right here, uh, you know, that graph right there was a conceptual, uh, what we see in many, many studies. A local example is on this graph right here. What I have is on the top uh, graph, this is the soil moisture content. Um, in the early months, a few years ago, on a uh, silty clay soil, so this is one of our Fargo soil series of very high clay and silt content uh, for it. And this is soil moisture at a two inch depth. Uh, the bottom graph is the uh, soil temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, uh, also at a two inch depth. And we've got uh, um, uh, four different tillage practices that we had on this field. Um, so, but the main thing I want you to notice is that uh, you can see in this bottom graph in the first uh, couple of weeks here, we had, you know, temperature in the soil was right around freezing a little bit below. So we're coming out of winter and then suddenly you can see the temperatures jump up above 32 and we start thawing that soil. The first time that they jump above 32, if you look up here at the moisture graph now, you can see that suddenly all the moisture jump up real fast. Um, uh, it, that, jumping of moisture isn't from snowmelt infiltrating, it's actually from ice thawing. 
the type of sensors that we use are electric sensors. And any electric sensor, including the sensors that Indon run, has on uh, their weather stations, and, and uh, it's, electric sensors is the most dominant uh, type of uh, technology that's used for soil moisture sensing. Uh, they don't detect ice. They only detect the liquid water. So when they're frozen and you see that, like, wow, it looks like the ground's really dry. It's not. It's just that uh, most of the water is in ice uh, and it's more of an ice detector now. So, but that big jump, you can see that suddenly that soil thawed. And you can see, you know, the types of tillages here, some had much higher water content, some had much lower water content when it first came out of the winter uh, uh, thaw. And they stayed different for uh, about a week, a week and a half. And then you can see they start coming together uh, because we did not get another rainfall. And we actually had about three weeks without any uh, rainfall event after the snow melt. And you can tell that first week and a half, there's moisture differences. The next two weeks afterwards, the, it, the soil is the same. Uh, uh, dried out just the same and to give you an idea of how much residue uh, differences there were in between these tillage uh, treatments here uh, some of these treatments had residue levels as low as 30% um, ground cover other ones had as high as 80% residue cover. So in between 30 and 80% of the ground cover with residue they dried out the same and behave the same because we didn't get any additional rainfall that occurred. It was a dry spring. So when it's dry, everything's dry. When it's wet, that's when you see differences in tillage uh, and residue management emerge uh, on the ability of the ground to dry out. So this is a local example. This was a down around Morton, North Dakota um, on a Fargo silty clay soil. So Early season differences in temperature and drying out after a wet uh, spring or after a wet fall or an even in a wet spring, uh, you know, we think about that getting off the crop uh, to a good start or a poor start perhaps. But does it matter by the end of the year when we look at yields? Because that's what we're really interested in is the how much we can sell our yields for to get an economic return off of them. So what I want to show now is uh, some uh, production scale tillage trials. That was a collaboration in between MDSU and uh, University of Minnesota that included uh, Jody Dijon Hughes and Abby Wick and myself uh, on it. And uh, you can kind of see uh, the scale of our, these tillage trials. This was uh, actually on that field that's Fargo Silty Clay. Uh, soil that uh, uh, moisture and temperature grass just came off of. Uh, we have these big uh, strips down the field uh, with the different tillage practices. We had chisel plow in the fall with a spring field cultivator pass. We had two different types of strip tillage, a fall shank system. We also had a spring culture system where fertilizer was put down in the berms with the strip till uh, implements. We also had a shallow vertical till that was only uh, tilling uh, down uh, an inch or two. Uh, it was more so just for chopping up the residue and thinning down the residue layer. It's not really doing any tillage or digging itself. It's just for thinning down that residue layer to try to see if we could get a high percent residue cover, which is good for erosion control, but also being able to thin down that residue layer to get water to evaporate out in these uh, soils that can uh, be difficult on getting water to drain down. Um, and here in the foreground in the image, um, this was done on uh, one half of the field that was tile drained in the background of the image. You'll see the exact same setup uh, and strips back there. Uh, that's on an on tile drain portion of the field as well. But this gives you an idea of uh, scale, and you can see um, the planter out here uh, in the spring planting. So temperature-wise, with soil uh, warming up is about what you would expect in between these different types of uh, 
uh, practices. We also had areas that were in no-till that we monitored, uh, that we had as buffer strips uh, around uh, these research tiles that we ran for uh, four years uh, on a variety of sites. So these are average soil temperatures uh, across the three farms. For it. the three farms that we had, uh, the one uh, that was on the Fargo silty clay soil, high clay content. We also had another one over by Barney, uh, North Dakota, that was on a, a sandy loam site. And then the third site over near Fergus Falls, Minnesota, that was on a loam clay loam site. So we covered a lot, you know, clay soils, loamy soils, and sandy soils for it. So these are average temperatures across all three farms, and they fall almost spot on with that uh, Fergus Falls site that had the loam soils for it. Uh, but what you see is that, you know, the uh, chisel plow uh, soil uh, or chisel plow treatments and the berms of the strip tills, whether it was fall shank or spring culture, it did not matter. Those uh, systems warmed up just uh, pretty much the same. And many times uh, the strip till was just slightly ahead of that of the chisel plow. Now, if you look at um, the no-till areas, they were typically seven, eight, nine degrees cooler than that of the uh, chisel plow areas uh, and the strip till berms, as you would expect, because there's a lot of uh, residue and thick residue, and these were in corn soybean rotations. The vertical till uh, to where we have uh, around 70, 80% residue cover uh, on it, uh, but not doing much digging, it's just thinning down that residue layer. They warmed up only a few degrees behind the chisel plow and the strip till burns on it. Uh, if you look at where the no-till temperatures were and the chisel plow or strip till temperatures were, the vertical till didn't even fall necessarily midway. It still leaned towards that of uh, the chisel plow and the strip till because we thinned down the residue layer able to get water out and it was able to warm up quite nicely in there even though it has a very high amount of residue cover on it. And on our vertical tills we did two pass system one in the fall and then one in the spring where we also broadcasted fertilizer in front of it and used it to uh, mix in try to get a little bit uh, soil contact with the fertilizer on that second spring pass. Uh, and if you think about drying down wise, um, this match the same, pretty much the same story here. Uh, story here, the chisel plow and the strip till berms dried down the most, uh, as you would expect. The uh, no-till uh, had higher water content, as you would expect from all abundance of uh, residue there. And that vertical till, again, it dried out if you look at where the no-till is versus the chisel plow and the strip till uh, on it, it dry out midway, it still leaned towards being closer dryness wise to the chisel plow and the berm of the strip till. Now the nice thing on the strip till is that just a few inches away underneath the big layer or thick layer of residue that gets moved off uh, right in front of the shank or the culture, uh, and that the trash cleaners just move off to the side. Uh, you have an abundance of water right there. Uh, that's a nice storage that conserves and stays throughout uh, uh, much later into the growing season. And uh, when the plant needs water and late uh, summer uh, dry spells perhaps, but it's of no consequence to the early year um, uh, temperatures in the berms there. So that's a nice combination of of uh, getting best of both worlds of dry and warming, but yet also conserving the water for times when the crop will need it uh, the most uh, for it. Now, what, what does that all mean by the end of the year, yield-wise? Uh, well, let's take a look at some of this real quick, uh, try to uh, go through this uh, gracefully to some extent. So here we're looking at the Fergus Falls and the Barney sites. So this is the Fergus Falls site, um, is the one with the loam, clay loam soils. Uh, the Barney site is the one with the sandy loam soils. Um, this was corn, year, uh, corn yields for 2015. Here, we saw one treatment was different from the rest at the clay, clay loam site. Um, the strip till with the shank that was done in the fall 
yielded about seven bushels, six, seven bushels uh, lower than that of the other treatment systems, which didn't, none of those differed at all uh, from each other. And the thing is, is that that strip till shank wasn't because of the strip till system itself. Uh, what happened here was when we were putting in the fall chisel plowing, uh, vertical till uh, pass, and that, that strip till with shank pass. The chisel plow was put in, the vertical till was put in, but when we started putting in the strip till with shank, it started raining at the site. So we held off, uh, we waited a little while, but then the ground started freezing. Uh, or we started getting into where uh, the ground was going to start freezing. So, and we didn't want to uh, uh, kind of chunk in the strip till after the ground had frozen. We had to have to come back and refresh in the strip in the spring anyways, probably because it would be too chunky. Um, so we went ahead and put in the strip till with shank when it was probably a little bit too wet. And when we dug down and looked at the sidewalls, you could see that it was kind of glossy, uh, which indicates that it had a smeared sidewall to it. Um, a good indicator or what you really want to look for, whether it's the bottom of a tillage depth or on sidewalls of something like strip till, is that if the soil looks like it's a matte finish, that's good. You didn't smear anything. But if it looks like glossy paint uh, on it, then you smeared the soil and that has a yield consequence to it. And in this case, tilling when it was too wet had a seven bushel per acre consequence to it. Uh, because of the timing, the soil moisture condition uh, when it went in. And the thing here that I want to really emphasize is that tilling to dry a wet soil uh, kind of goes against our intuition uh, on what actually happens. If it is as a rule of thumb, if it is too wet to plant, it is too wet to till without smearing that soil. And so if you're going to till a soil uh, to get it to dry out so that you can plant, the tillage itself is going to cause a yield reduction uh, there. So very cautious in the spring on wet soils to try to use tillage to increase the amount of uh, evaporation that's going to occur uh, for it. What I would suggest is actually just uh, try to uh, either um, uh, don't do any tillage at all and really get to know your planter much better because their planters are pretty awesome out there. You can adjust them and get used to. Uh, this might be your opportunity to see what your planter can really do in a high residue situation or go in and just thin down the residue layer without actually digging uh, and uh, smearing that soil for it. So, but if we go on to 2016 and soybean at both those fields, no differences at all I mean, between any of the tillage treatments, even though they were differences in uh, temperature and moisture early in the year. In 2017, no differences in corn yields in, in between the two sites uh, among the tillage treatments. In 2018, we did see a increase in about a four, uh, uh, three to four bushel per acre uh, boost in soybean uh, in the strip till, both of them, whether it's fall shank or sprinkle, at the sandy site, uh, because later in the year, we had some dry spell in the summer in that reservoir just a few inches off the side. Uh, apparently helped out that crop and gave it uh, a nice yield boost um, at that point for it. So in general, soybeans are pretty resistant or intolerant to all sorts of things. They're a very tough crop actually, except for salts, they're very weak on salts. But otherwise, uh, uh, very rarely do we actually see a tillage effect on soybeans, uh, even though they're being planted after corn uh, for it. Now, if we go to that silty clay uh, soil, that high clay soil, uh, what I want to point out here is uh, in 2016 in corn, uh, there's, as I mentioned before, there was a uh, uh, side, once the north side of the field was tile drain, that's the first two column of yield. The second two column of yield, that's the non-tile drain parts. We also notice that I uh, include saline and non-saline portions of the field because uh, we 
the western side was a saline sea. The eastern side uh, had no salinity problems on it. So we kind of have the combination of saline, non-saline, towel drain, non-towel drain uh, uh, to be able to take a look at. But in here in 2016 on the corn yield, the top table here, uh, there was one effect of tillage, and that was the vertical till yielded <laughs> around 20 bushels per acre lower in a lot of cases uh, than all the rest. Uh, but again, this was not a tillage issue here. What happened here is that uh, the fall pass went in, but then the spring pass where we were going to incorporate uh, or you know, broadcast nitrogen fertilizer out uh, in front of the tillage implement uh, and then use the tillage implement to incorporate it a little bit. Um, our equipment rep was actually out of the country and we weren't able to do the second pass. So fertilizer got broadcast on the surface and we just got a lot of uh, uh, emission losses of nitrogen there. And so this is a nutrient management issue. This is not a tillage issue or tillage effect here is a uh, fertilizer effect for it. So, you know, the biggest part about uh, getting these tillage programs to work is getting down the nutrient uh, programs uh, first for them. Uh, typically, nutrient consequences to yields are much higher than that of a yield consequence or a yield benefit of tillage either. So, uh, and in most cases, if you've got the fertilizer program figured out and down solid, uh, your tillage effect tends to disappear, uh, good or bad wise on it. So uh, nutrient availability and access uh, is a good way of, of uh, uh, kind of eliminating even the need for tillage whatsoever in a lot of systems. Uh, in the bottom graph on soybeans here, what we saw was that there was no tillage effect on it, but we actually saw uh, 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 what appeared to be a difference in whether the ground was towel drain. The blue circle here is the two towel drain uh, areas, uh, whether it's saline or non-saline. And the red circle is the untiled drain area. And you can see that there's around a seven, seven and a half bushel difference in between uh, a boost from tile drainage versus area that wasn't tile drained for it. Um, and this is something that I really want to emphasize here is that uh, here the drainage uh, was controlling the issues uh, for it. And when I talked about when you have two options of getting rid of water, drain it down or evaporate it up, draining down is a much more efficient uh, and uh, productive way of getting a soil to dry out in terms of, of crop uh, success um, and yields for it. And there's a difference in between having a drainage problem versus having a tillage uh, or residue uh, problem with excess moisture. A tillage program will not be able to fix a drainage problem. So um, if you have a drainage problem, um, it's going to take a drainage solution to deal with it because uh, tillage is not going to be in the same ballpark of just being a viable tool to fix a drainage issue. Uh, you won't be able to do it uh, with it. So being able to identify what's a drainage issue versus, which is pretty much more severe issues, versus what's a, um, a residue moisture excess issue it is important on picking what's even your right approach to dealing with your uh, specific fields and situation. So this next graph here, you know, that was, um, or the previous graphs, that was for those research trials that we had on three farms of production scale. Uh, one of the things that Jody Gijon Hughes and I did uh, in our Upper Midwest Tillage Guide that was published in 2017 that you can Google and check out, a lot of great information in there. Uh, we uh, looked at a variety of research trials in the regions uh, and summarized those on when, how often, what's the odds of having a uh, corn yield response to different tillage methods out there. And so this uh, uh, chart right here shows 18 site years across North Dakota and Minnesota in between 2005 and 2012. 
And what we have here is that 44% of the time in a corn system, corn sweetening system, uh, it didn't matter what you did tillage wise, they yield the same. 44% uh, of the time strip tillage will outperform the other tillage uh, options for it. And only 12% of the time will chisel plow actually uh, give you a yield boost uh, compared to something else uh, that's significant. And so if you think about 12% of your fields, uh, so, um, you know, it's like um, one out of every eight fields um, or one out of every eight years, you can get a chisel plow uh, to get a yield uh, benefit for it. So if you think about the economics of it and your tillage, if you're doing tillage, there's some cost associated with that tillage pass or those two tillage passes for it. You want to be able to just not only break even, you need to make more yields to make it worth the time to profit off of that. So if you're only getting a one out of every eight fields, one out of every eight years uh, return on seeing a yield boost, uh, that yield boost has to be enough to account for all those yields, years and fields that aren't responding to it. And the vast majority of the time, we just don't see uh, chisel plowing, being able to pay for itself, usually it's a loss uh, because of these odds and occurrences of when it actually sees a yield boost and that yield boost isn't high enough to cover those other years and other fields. If we go to soybeans, again, soybeans are very uh, resilient and actually my number disappeared here. This green, this big green area, about 74% of uh, or 76% of the whole graph uh, is they don't react to different tillages uh, methods out there. They just you know, they yield the same for it. 18% of the time you might see um, a yield boost from strip till because of the water uh, being available if it gets dry periods of year. And then chisel plowing uh, with field cultivation only 6% of the time you see uh, a benefit or a notable yield boost from it. So one out of every 15 years, one out of every 15 fields that that yield boost has to be able to also pay for uh, to not only break even, but try to make some money off of it as well uh, for it. And this is for 17 site years in that same interval uh, from 2005 to 2012 on a variety of studies in between North Dakota and Minnesota. In this next graph right here, um, uh, well, this next section, section we go into, so this would be still waiting to harvest uh, uh, out in uh, um, your fields. Uh, so um, the crop's still in there from 2019. So here, the first thing is, is when you go into harvest, oh, if you can, avoid those ruts because ruts will have a consequence for the next couple of years to come up on. So. Uh, wait for the soils to dry as much as possible uh, before you get in uh, so you don't have to spend more time out in the field leveling and filling and then also having the consequences for the next couple of years from the compaction that would have occurred underneath those ruts. If you have ruts, compaction happens. Uh, if you're able to harvest uh, uh, the 2000, if you were able to harvest when it was uh, frozen uh, out in the field, you know, look to minimize your tillage. Uh, again, if the soil is too wet to plant, it's too wet to till uh, without smearing it and have a yield consequence because of that smearing. Uh, this is a great opportunity actually to get to know your planters better than ever uh, if, if you haven't already. Uh, planters are really awesome out there. Uh, you can deal with very high residue uh, uh, zones and get some really great yield stance and a great crop uh, uh, from a field if you set up your planters well and adjust them often. Ideally, for every field that you're going into, uh, even as painstaking as that may sound, but adjusting the row cleaners, making sure the bars are uh, level, uh, uh, adjusting the road down pressures, uh, certainly taking a look and adjusting that closing wheel, making sure that it's getting, you know, it's closing right, but then it's also not pressing down too hard where you're giving some lift uh, and uh, the variable seed depth on it, and uh, making sure that those disc openers aren't dull for going through and 
doing those small adjustments will make a world of difference for getting a good stand in high residue conditions uh, for it. So, uh, and some areas it's just going to have to consider preventative plan based on the timing uh, that crops come out and, and depending on what our weather, spring uh, rainfalls end up doing uh, out here. So. Depending on when that's done, the spring rains, you might look into cover crop options if you're going into PP grounds. Uh, also check out the timelines and rules, see if that November date is changing. Um, uh, and what you might be able to do with something that you uh, uh, may plant uh, cover crop wise out there when you graze it uh, or harvest it for a cover crop uh, seed itself or something. So check out the rules on preventive crop. And also note that not only were we wet up here, but a lot, pretty much the whole entire Midwest was tremendously wet. So some seeds might be in higher demand throughout the entire um, Midwestern region and um, may affect seed availability for some of those cover crops. Uh, and then that last category there, uh, harvested during the fall or winter, but oh, look at those ruts that came out from it. And again, everyone had to face some tough decisions. No one likes to let a crop over winter, uh, but some fields were pretty severely rutted this year. Uh, so what can you expect from that? One of the things I like to do is kind of visualize what happens underneath the ground. This is a cool uh, uh, image from a field day uh, from a number of years ago uh, to where they dug out these pits, lined the soil back, but then put in lighter colored sand, drove heavy equipment over it. So there's a manure hauler here, uh, tires, uh, that's uh, two different types of tires. But the biggest thing is that the one on the right is overinflated, that's inflated at the road conditions. The one on the left is inflated for field conditions. Uh, if your tires are inflated for the road, so they're 40 plus PSI, they are too high for in the field. You want to get uh, those down around 10 PSI if you can uh, to be able to uh, uh, get all the area, full area of the, of the tread on the ground to distribute the weight. But here, just in between overinflated and underinflated, you see that the soil is still caused a rut, but how deep the compaction went uh, with the bending of those, you can see visually the bending of those uh, sand layers there. I highlight them in red. You can see that the overinflated one went much deeper than uh, the properly inflated uh, uh, tire for it. Even though the rut depth where this yellow line is here is the same. Uh, that's what I want to emphasize here is that the depth of the rut, unfortunately, doesn't tell you much about how deep the compaction went. The only thing you know for sure is that you do have compaction underneath it and out to the sides from that, um, uh, uh, from that rut. And our, with our equipment weights and axle loads that we have these days on combines and grain wagons and stuff like that, um, our compaction is deep and it goes deeper than what uh, tillage implements can reach uh, for certain. And so what can you expect with these? Well, uh, back one last uh, times we had some really wet conditions in 2009. Uh, Jody Jones Hughes had seven farms uh, in western Minnesota that were looked at fields that had ruts in them and then adjacent areas within those fields that uh, didn't have ruts and on that the producer stayed off of. And they looked to see what consequence that had on the next year and the year afterwards, uh, corn and soybean uh, yields from them. And on those rutted areas, they filled in the ruts with a chisel plow um, uh, 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 before they went in and planted on them. So, and you can see on the left-hand figure here, this is the first year after and corn and you get these nice uh, this the left image is where there were no ruts uh, so a nice even uh, cob size and grain counts on them on the one on the right is where the ruts were and you can see the variability in how the crop how the plants were doing with it so that has a yield consequence uh, so in 2010 uh, all seven locations were in corn um, in between rutted and non-rutted area. Uh, the stands didn't differ, the grain moisture didn't differ. There was significantly uh, 
lower uh, plant heights uh, in the rutted areas and also the growth stage lag behind as you would expect and there was a 17 percent hit or drop on the yields from those rutted areas in that first year after uh, the ruts occurred in. In the second year afterwards when these fields were in soybeans the exact same story stands and grain moistures didn't differ plant heights were lower in the rutted areas growth stage lagged behind in the rutted areas and again a 16 percent loss on yields uh, in those areas for them uh, they didn't go into a third year afterwards but this data is very consistent uh, with the much broader literature across the world for a variety of crops. If you look at deep uh, compaction that goes beyond the topsoil, beyond the reach of uh, tillage equipment and stuff, uh, you'll see a yield drop around 15 or 20 percent. Uh, sometimes it might extend up to 30 percent, sometimes it might only be 10 percent. But in that range, in the first couple of years, you'll see a multiple year effect from that but then we'll taper off and then eventually get back up higher. There may be even a permanent uh, yield consequence that doesn't emerge every single year. Uh, you know, when you think five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years afterwards, but on inclement weather years, you might see a 5% drop, uh, a two to 5% drop on those yields. So uh, because of that deep compaction, that just takes a tremendous amount of time to heal. So some strategies for dealing with ruts, uh, if you have those, is uh, just level off the ruts uh, and, and only till only as deep or shallower than the rut itself. Uh, just enough to be able to get in and spring plant. It's probably going to take a couple passes to do it. Uh, thing is, is that subsoils dry slower than topsoil, so the only way to insult uh, compaction uh, is to smear it. Uh, so if you're digging into wet subsoil by trying to go deeper than the bottom of the rut, uh, you're probably not doing much any good uh, and you potentially could be actually making it worse because the only way to insult uh, compaction is to uh, smear the soil along with compaction. You get these slabs of soil that's really unpleasant to plant into. For ruts that are uh, less than four inches, you might use a secondary tillage implement to do it in a couple passes. If it's greater than four inches, then you might get out the chisel plow and start filling those in. Uh, and again, multiple passes would probably be needed for it. Good strategies for any year is uh, that uh, uh, probably adjusting the tire pressures for them. Uh, finding ways to minimize the number of passes on your fields because it, with a uh, uh, typical corn soybean rotation uh, that has tillage in uh, the program, you can easily, you know, cover 70, 80, 90 plus percent of that field within a given year. Uh, so minimizing the number of field passes will minimize the odds of uh, compaction uh, uh, that you have to deal with. Minimize your loads, control traffic if you can based on the uh, size of equipment that you had and avoid wet soils uh, if possible. Avoid those ruts because you might get a crop out but then you're you can expect that 15 uh, to 20 percent yield loss for the next two years because of it. Uh, especially on fields that have from one end to the next uh, every single pass of the combine, there's a rut, uh, which we've had a number of fields like that this year because of the tough, wet fall that we uh, endured. And the biggest thing is patience. Uh, a few extra days of waiting will go a long way as uh, helping protect your soil from the occurrence of compaction occurring in the first place. Uh, which if you can prevent the occurrence of it, then you don't have to uh, worry about the time needed to try to remediate it uh, and the yield losses that are gonna come with it even when you try to remediate it. And uh, a few uh, items here is that, uh, um, that I like to throw out there is that mechanically working the soil homogenizes it. So this is strategy for any year still. Um, as a soil physicist, I think of what makes a good um, uh, soil, uh, good healthy soil. A lot of folks think biology-wise in a physics manner. I think about what uh, a great soil is a soil that can drain very efficiently and well, which you have to have pores, mini pores, big pores to be able to do that. But it's also strong and firm enough to hold up uh, your equipment. That is what makes a good 
uh, healthy soil is having simultaneously good drainage and strong soil to hold you up on. Uh, when we mechanically work a soil, we homogenize it, we make it weaker to where equipment doesn't stand on top of it, and it actually can reduce drainage for it uh, because we're aiming for water going up, not water going down necessarily, particularly below that tillage depth uh, for it. Uh, and it's a high input on your behalf. Um, uh, natural ways, uh, not mechanical ways, but natural ways that soils uh, aggregate, they add a lot of cohesion and friction to the soil, so that's what makes them strong, is when you have cohesion and friction in the soil, uh, in between those aggregates, they can stand up, and because you're making aggregates, the spaces in between them is what lets water drain very well. Unfortunately, we do not have a uh, mechanical tillage implement that works at the aggregate scale, uh, at those aggregate sizes. Uh, our equipment works at, you know, uh, inches to a half a foot or a foot uh, scale, which is too big uh, to be able to work and get both those realities of good drainage and strong and firm soils for equipment to stand on to happen that, you know, to, to actually occur. So, uh, unfortunately, we just don't have that technology that exists, but we have many natural ways that that does exist. Every time you get in another crop in a root system uh, that's not broken up afterwards, uh, every freeze thaw, wetting and drying with cracking and shrinking and swelling that occurs, you get aggregate formations. And tillage uh, innately homogenizes and unworks aggregation for it. So, Something to keep in mind uh, because these wet falls are probably, uh, uh, one, they happen and they re-happen. And so if we're dealing with compacted soils from uh, ruts and trying to fix those, it has a multi-year consequence to it. Uh, if we have wet events uh, every uh, 10 uh, or less years, uh, then the number of years that we're maximizing our yields uh, become quite limited. So, and that's what I've got for you for uh, challenges and some uh, thoughts and uh, hopefully advice for you for dealing with residue, high residue after a wet uh, harvest, uh, uh, some expectations from different tillage programs that you can have and consequences of tilling when it's too wet. Certainly a thing to uh, uh, exercise caution with, with this spring. And then also dealing with ruts uh, for uh, of uh, quite a number of folks that uh, uh, are having to deal with those this, this spring or did have to deal with them also in the fall. So uh, I have my email address here. Feel free to contact me if you ever have any questions or want some more information on these studies. And I've put a few links out here, one for that upper Midwest tillage guide that I mentioned earlier that Jody and I wrote back in 2017. Also have uh, an op-ed that I had uh, in uh, Ag Week back in the fall on this idea, on this uh, content right here, uh, as well as a few other um, uh, interesting or amusing links that you might find useful. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak at this uh, uh, virtual Langdon Soil Health Workshop, and I hope you all are uh, doing well and staying safe out there. And again, uh, please feel free to contact me uh, at any time if you wish. Thanks again and take care. Bye bye. So, I hope that everyone enjoyed the presentation. It was very informative. And I could see that the chat box is full. <laughs> so, um, Abby, you, you still think that we need to answer some of these questions from the chat box or you have answered most of them? Uh, I think I answered most of them in the, in the chat box if people want to look at that. But, you know, there are some questions about, um, like on the, the, the tillage study being done at the Morton's share farm and then also the sites in Minnesota and um, just north of Morton and about whether, you know, the, the direction of the tillage usually, you know, chisel plow or something like vertical till tillage would be done at an angle um, to the planting direction and how that might have influenced the results. Um, and I think, I, th I think it definitely could have. I mean, going at an angle would, would certainly be beneficial for, for corn residue. Um, but I also, you know, we took pretty good residue counts, um, 
residue percentage on those fields. And I feel pretty confident. I mean, the chisel plow was black. Um, so there was a really good working in of the residue and, and you could see residue differences, um, whether that would be, maybe you just look at it as relative to each other versus, um, versus how it might be going at an angle in the field. But, um, but that would be something kind of that I'd be curious at looking at and, and asking Aaron about is if maybe they took some measurements from fields surrounding that had those same treatments um, and how that compared to those. Um, the other question that was kind of asked is about how do you talk about ruts and management um, in a no-till area, like particularly the western part of, the, of North Dakota. Um, and it seems like, like, yeah, I mean, we're, we're not, you know, using, using tillage in the western part of the state is probably not something that people are going to do. Um, but, you know, I think if there are ruts, they're going to have to knock the tops off somehow. And I know that there are some no-tillers on this call, and this is where everybody gets kind of nervous and when I know your name and, and what you do. Um, but I think in a lot of those scenarios, we're just kind of knocking the tops off um, with maybe a shallow vertical tillage or um, like some farmers I work with, they'll set a disc on the road um, to make sure that it stays very shallow as they cross the field and they're only hitting those areas where in their no-till systems that are long-term no-till, they're only hitting those areas that they um, that they have ruts and avoiding the other parts of the field. So, um, so I don't know if anybody who is a no-tiller on this call wants to wants to talk about maybe what you've tried um, in those systems as well, or if there are other questions that people just want to ask instead of put in the chat box. This is the fun part where everybody has to figure out where their unmute is. Um, should we, for a moment, unmute everyone? Um, I don't, there might be some people with kids in the background, which could be pretty noisy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see anybody calling in. So most of the people are either using their smartphones or their computers and it should be the mute or unmute button should be on the left, bottom left. Hey, I see Marla Rickman from Manitoba on here. Can we can we call on you, Marla? I know you've done a ton of tillage research. Hey, Abby, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. So yeah, we um, I wouldn't say that I've done a ton of tillage research, but um, we are uh, actually looking a little bit right now at a lot of corn residue heavy corn residue around the valley part of Manitoba and the heavy or clays where um, either the crop didn't come off last fall or it came off in the winter. And so I, we've seen a fair bit of burning of that heavy corn residue happening so far just as a way to kind of get rid of some of it to get started. So I am running around and um, doing a little bit of monitoring on a few fields where you've got neighbors who are, you know, one's burning, one's tilling, and just taking a look at how that's going to progress through the spring and whether we're going to see differences and if there was any actual advantage of burning. One of the questions that comes up when I talk to some of the farmers is, well, if I'm burning but not tilling, is that better than tilling in the residue? And so, so I mean, those are good kind of theoretical questions to discuss. Yeah, do you have opinion on that, whether burning would be better than tilling or? Well, as a government person, I'm supposed to always say that burning is bad. Um, but uh, uh, at this point, I don't really know. What We're seeing pretty decent burns on some of the, uh, the residue in terms of just removing it. Um, there has been long-term studies looking at removal of crop residue by uh, baling, which does not take all of the surface residue off. Um, that shows that like in long-term soil health kind of conditions, you don't see a huge decrease in soil carbon over time with that, that removal of residue. It'll be interesting to see, I mean, if we had any studies looking at burning as a long-term solution, but this is a short-term thing. And, and in a case where we're dealing with farmers who are um, kind of struggling with very wet soils and that heavy, heavy thatch of residue, if burning is the thing that they're going to try this year, um, 
it's just this year. And a lot of the guys who are talking about it, this isn't a common thing. Some of them are saying like, I haven't burnt in X number of years, don't really want to do it, but this is the, the choice I'm making this year because it seems like the, the cheaper and easier alternative than trying to get across the field when it's wet and till it. Yeah, I think that's that's good advice. As long as it doesn't become a habit or a long-term solution. Um, exactly, exactly. It's reasonable to, to implement all the tools we have in the toolbox. Um, yeah, I have farmers that I work with too that, that will be burning fields and, um, and it's, you know, they've exhausted, you know, five other options and that's kind of their last resort in some cases. And some of them can't burn a field because it's too close to town or whatever else that they're concerned about it. So, um, but yeah, it seems like if you, if you try to, whatever you do this year in these wet conditions, just don't make it a habit maybe in the future. Yeah. And then hopefully the wet conditions don't become a habit too. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> Any other comment? For me, there were a couple takeaway points. Um, like um, I hear this a lot around Langdon that, you know, we got to dry down the soil. Well, what um, Aaron said actually that um, just doing the tillage on wet soils will re reduce the yields. And the only reason people want to till or dry their soils because they want to plant it early and they're looking to plant early because they think it's going to give them better yields. But if you are co compacting your fields and you're going to be losing your leads yields right there because you tell the wet field, what's the point of doing all that? And then the difference between all the tillage practice was week, week and a half at most. They roughly then come to the same level, moisture levels or temperature levels. And then we also have drainage issues. We are slightly drier in the Northeast in 17, 18, early part of 19. Um, September and August were very wet in October. Uh, but before that, we were quite dry here. So it's slightly different than the Eastern part of the state. But Aaron also said that um, doing tillage basically hurts the drainage. So to me, I don't know what's the, um, very ideal solution, but I would say that wherever we could avoid tillage, it's it's better. Um, yeah, and I agree with that. If you like, he was saying with the planters, if you can adjust your planter and and use that to your advantage this year and direct seed into some of the residue versus trying to work it prior to planting, that that may be that may be the best approach, um, especially if this window becomes very tight for planting. Um, that. I would just, I, I, I would consider that. And that's what I kept hearing for a lot of the cafe talks we had this winter was, you know, what do you do with the fields in the spring? And, and a lot of it is just, if you can direct seed into it, modify your equipment to make sure it has sharp um, disc openers and that it's ready to go um, and, and check your, check it as you go in the field. Um, but that seems like pretty good advice. And if that doesn't work, then you, then you look at some other options and, and try to figure out how to, how to manage it from that. And you know, uh, no-till planting r will work very good um, if we had soybeans last year. They don't leave a lot of residue. Even it's, it could work in canola fields if they were harvested last fall. Um, corn is a different, you know, kind of a like issue. Maybe wheat is stubble, maybe a bit difficult for people, but there are crops. And if we just avoid, it's, we get, we got this question, Abby, during the cafe talk a lot that, you know, for some people, it's either no-till or nothing. We looked at it, like if you avoid some tillage passes or wherever you could plant without doing any tillage, is it good for the soil? I would say 100%. It's better. It's not to that level where, um, you know, like we go no-till. You know, I understand we won't get those benefits, but wherever we could... Uh, reduce tillage will save money and there would be some benefits to the soil too. Yeah. So, and if you have to PP a field, um, do it. And I think, uh, I think we'll, we'll have some good, maybe we'll do some more webinars coming out on, on cover crops for plant mixes. And there is some information on the NDSU Soil Health webpage too, um, regarding preventive planting. So, if you go to the homepage, ndsu.edu slash soil health, you can find some information there now if you want to start digging around and looking at it. Um, but I imagine we'll come back with some more information on PP because some of these fields just, if you can't get in it, 
and do a good job, then maybe it just, it's not one that you can do. So, um, so unfortunately that seems like the situation we're in right now, but you can build great soil health with a year. You get a free year of kind of cover crops and building up that soil and transitioning to a reduced till system. And, and it, um, maybe that's the one way to look at it. So we have another webinar Thursday, right? Naeem, yep. that's yep. my webinar. Yeah, yeah, and so Abby will talk about the soil health practices, which actually help again with the wet fields. The way we have designed these topics that, you know, a lot of people are worried about, you know, wet is spring and um, the challenges which that brings. So Abby's presentation would roughly be the same, but Abby would take a different approach, which I'm not gonna talk about right now because I don't wanna spoil the fun. And, um, Abby's presentation is about 27 minutes long. The reason I want to point that out because some people may think that today's presentation was belong. So every speaker is different and the topics they cover are slightly different and everybody has a different style. So uh, next Thursday, same time, 11 o'clock. And hopefully um, you guys, if you faced any problems in terms of getting the link right or whatever else, because I was getting, I was getting text um, from the group text I sent like five minutes before, can you text me the link, you know, so hopefully those people, um, um, you know, got it figured out. So next Thursday, that would be the second one. And then uh, two weeks after that, again, we'll have webinar, one presentation and then question and answer or discussions, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 11 o'clock, same link, same telephone number. Yep. And if you need the information early, we have four of the yep. of the six webinars posted on the NDSU Soil Health webpage on the webinar tab. So if you anticipate that you're going to be busy at that time and you can't catch it, you can still get the information and just watch the recorded webinar. Um, but then tune in if you want to, to have some of the discussion. So, um, so for example, on Thursday, say you don't, you've already watched that webinar for 27 minutes and you just want to come in at 1130, you could probably catch a lot of discussion at that point too. So um, so hopefully that helps with some of these schedules as they get a little crazier this, this spring. But, um, but yeah, today was great. We had 75 people. Thanks for, for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, we hope that you found it useful. And hopefully we'll have more people on Thursday. <laughs> um, and again, like Abby said, not only these presentation, but we could also, Abby, provide links for this whole uh, session, for example, which include the presentation, plus all of the questions um, and the discussions we are having so that, um, you know, the people can access these at any time, whatever time works for them. Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully we see a lot of you on Thursday and um, good luck. Good luck this spring. Thanks, everyone. Thank <music> you.